So shall we just start? Yes. Yep. Okay, very good. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, the start of the new thematic program. And the I'm, my name is Kumar Murthy. I'm the director of the Kyoto Institute. And one of the privileges and honors of uh, being the director is uh, the opportunity to welcome participants to uh, programs and to workshops and conferences. We're doing this not in person, but online, but still it's nice to see uh, a lot of people here and their faces from all, all over the world. Uh, it looks like it's going to be an exciting program, uh, a stellar organizing committee led by our own uh, local Patrick uh, Spicer from McMaster. And uh, this particular workshop also has a good set of organizers, uh, lots of activity, good successor to our program last term on uh, model theory. So I think you'll find it uh, uh, very productive. I'm hoping you'll find it very productive and fruitful, this, this conference and this work, uh, this uh, term. Uh, a few words about the Fields Institute. Many of you are familiar with the Institute, but uh, um, I would like for those who are new, uh, we are a, a research institute uh, physically located in uh, Toronto. Uh, we are a network of about 20 uh, principal sponsoring and affiliated universities. We are funded by uh, the federal government in Canada, the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council and by the province of Ontario. Uh, we're also funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Uh, we are uh, American organizations. We're funded by the National Science Foundation and the Simons Foundation. And we're also uh, uh, funded partly by our, our partner universities, uh, in addition to uh, uh, individual, generous individuals who support the activities of the Institute. Um, so we are grateful to all of these people and we often report the uh, outcomes of our programs back to them uh, so that they continue to fund us. So I wish you uh, a lot of success in your in your um, discussions and your uh, talks. And I hope you prove a lot of new theorems and write a lot of new papers and give me a lot of good statistics to report back to our organizations so that we can talk about the success of the Institute. Once again, uh, welcome uh, virtually to this uh, conference and to the thematic program. And I hand you over now to uh, the organizers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, back now. Uh, so our first speaker is Chris Miller. And we'll wait. Uh, okay, Chris. Uh, we'll speak about theme uh, control theory, and uh, let's start. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Let me get this uh, thing going here. Is it there? There we go. Um, okay. Great. All right. So, yeah, so that's me, and there's a description of the talk. Um, uh, thank you to Kumar for the excellent introduction. I, I had, uh, when I was first constructing this talk, I thought that I would make some remarks about the impact of fields itself on several of the themes in this workshop. Um, I could start 25 years ago when I had a, a postdoc uh, in January of 97 with the Geometry and Singularity Theory program running concurrently with a with an algebraic model theory program. But once I started writing all the stuff down, there, there, there were too many mini workshops and thematic programs and, and, and seminars and uh, so many things I realized that it would have to be a 25 minute talk for me to really go into that very deeply. But uh, for, for any uh, junior people out there, uh, let me assure you that uh, 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 fields has been absolutely uh, significant in, again, not just showcasing what we've been doing, but actually the development. A lot of the theorems, some of the main theorems that are, that are coming up during this uh, program were actually even proved at, at fields. So it's it's a great place to be. And there's a lot of history there, but I guess I'm, I think I'm going to have to skip that for now. Uh, let's see what else am I going to do? I'm going to, uh, oh, no, that's good enough. All right, so uh, this is in fact, it is a promotional talk for my module in uh, the second module in one of the graduate courses. A secondary um, goal is of mine is to give a sort of soft introduction 
to the, some themes that are gonna come up over and over uh, with other people through presenting my, the special case uh, that I'll be talking about uh, of this tameness business. Um, before I get going on there, I, I have to say, uh, I'm definitely a product of the 20th century. So um, something's, uh, oh well, something's funny going on there. So, okay. So my preferences, I don't have any preferences on pronouns, but uh, but I thought I was going to be giving this talk uh, at a chalkboard in person. And that that's basically what I'm mentally equipped to handle. I, I can't do chat. I can't pay attention to anything else while I'm speaking. So uh, please bear in mind that uh, that, that I, I, I can't follow all this technology stuff. And you might as well behave as though this were an in-person talk uh, because that's all I can handle. Um, as usual, there will be the 10 minutes for questions or comments after the presentation. Um, I will not be monitoring any texts or anything like that. So uh, please, please uh, keep that in mind. Now, why isn't this working? Ah, okay, I have no idea. Some of the buttons I'm used to using aren't gonna work, so I guess I'll scroll. Okay, um, so here we go. Uh, we're gonna start off with some, with some de basic definitions. So unless I say otherwise, a vector field is nothing but a map from a subset of Rn into Rn. Uh, I, I can hear bells going off in some people's heads already saying, well, that's not a vector field. You need more assumptions. But my approach here is going to be to take um, the simplest possible definitions I can use to get, uh, get things started. And I will complicate them when necessary. And then we'll see why we're complicating them instead of accepting them up front for efficiency's sake. Um, a solution of the vector field is simply a differentiable uh, function from some kind of uh, non-trivial interval. Um, could have endpoints, could maybe not have endpoints uh, that satisfies the differential equation. And now this is where things get a little bit uh, dicey is I'm, I'm going to use the word trajectory to just be the image of a solution. Uh, I know I have, uh, when I started looking into the subject, I think in my office alone, I have books that say a trajectory is, has to have arrows attached. Another one says a trajectory is actually, these is the solution. Um, some people call them solution curves, streamlines, flow lines, um, lots and lots of stuff. If you don't like my use of the word, uh, that's fine, but I'm going to use it anyway. So it's just the image of a solution. And so it's going to be um, this, uh, just the set. It's the set. It's the trace, I guess, is also some people might call it. So we're going to start with these and we'll start developing the subject a bit. So here are the motivating but somewhat ill-posed questions that come up in a tameness type of program. Um, so uh, what, what should it mean for a collection of vector fields to be tame or mutually well-behaved or natural or you know whatever, whatever you might wanna put on here? We can ask the same kind of question for trajectories. And we can also ask the same kinds of questions for collections of pairs of trajectories uh, and vector fields. Oh, I see a minor technical issue. When I went to full screen, my clock was wiped out. So yes, the timekeepers are definitely going to have to stay on me. All right. So uh, th these kinds of questions are, are easy to ask. And uh, first order logic, model theory, is pretty well equipped to handle some of this. And that's uh, where, where I got interested in, how I got interested in the control theory aspect of this. So let's, we're gonna try to answer some of these questions, although again, they're a little bit vague and that's okay. So, so if you're familiar with first order logic, we're going to use, uh, 
you know, some of the by now routine conventions, definable is always going to mean definable with parameters. Um, but this is mostly for convenience. If we want to track parameters at some point, uh, we will. That's not an issue. I'll use this uh, overline blackboard R to uh, denote the real field. And then this uh, fract R, fracture R will just be some expansion in the sense of definability of the real field. So um, that's if you're familiar with first order logic. But in case you're not, we have this other slick little way of explaining it to people. So we can regard our structure as a sequence um, of Boolean algebras, basically, one for each RM that has the property that we can trivially fiber upwards into the next one. And we are closed under projecting from uh, one down to the other. This, so if I have a definable set here, so oops, if I have something in here, it's projection on the first and variables lives downstairs. And I need to start with something for my Boolean algebras. So in this case, I'm just going to take all zero sets of real polynomials and M variables. You can change this one and get different kinds of gains, but this is going to be the minimal setup that we're going to use. And um, so definable in our, when I, if we talk about definability in the structure, you can simply think of this as something that belongs to one of the RMs. It is extremely important to note that definability is always with respect to some given structure. It makes no sense to just talk about whether something is definable or not unless you know which structure you're talking about. So this is a, a pitfall that newcomers occasionally um, stumble on. Uh, it, we don't talk about just definable in, in, in the platonic realm or something. It has to be with respect to a given structure. Now, having, having said this, this, this beautiful little, uh, uh, this, 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 this nice little recipe for presenting this to mathematicians, it's actually not very easy to work with things this way. Anyone who's tried it learns this very quickly. Uh, it's really best to understand that, uh, that we're really doing definability and first order logic. Um, and these various operations here correspond to uh, unions, um, projections, identification of variables, and so on. So, but I think probably most of the people in the audience know about these things. All right, so then we're also going to just uh, fix some collection of trajectories of definable uh, in the structure vector fields. And now the game is, what can we say relative to what we started with about uh, this thing? If you're not familiar with this notation, it's certainly um, easy to see that if you have a, a structure in this, um, a set theoretic definition of it, and you have some new uh, sets that you want to add to it, you can certainly generate another structure that has everything in here together with your new information. So that's all this is. This is a shorthand for the structure generated over R by these new objects. So this is my special case of what to me is is uh, the the tameness game just as definability has to be with respect to a given structure tameness to me has to be about pairs of structures you you have you have one on the bottom that you uh, at least at least you say you you think you have an oracle for it you understand it to that to that extent you assume that you understand the uh, a particular structure you want to add some new information, in this case, a bunch of trajectories. And you then the question is, how well do you understand the new structure 
relative to what you started with. So tameness for me is also a relative notion, not uh, concrete or anything. So let's just note here some uh, silly things. If if every trajectory, uh, if every one of, if all of the new information is, if none of, if it's actually not new, then trivially we win because um, if we haven't added any new information, then we understand the situation precisely as much as we understood the old situation. Not very interesting, although in practice we might not know which ones are definable and whether they aren't. That is, can make the game much more interesting. And sometimes we have to figure that out before we can play the game. Now, this is a big thorn in all of our sides, and this is something that <laughs> comes up quite often. An expansion of the field of reals uh, it defines all trajectories, if and only if it defines the set of integers. This is actually a fairly weak statement. In fact, once you have the field of, once you have uh, information about the field of reals, and then you show it an oracle, uh, the information about the integers, you have Gödel's uh, theorem kicks in at the very least. And in the end, what happens is you get all Borel sets, then all projections of Borel sets and complements and so on. And in the end, you get all so-called real projective sets of descriptive set theory. Now, uh, descriptive set theory can is arguably tame compared to uh, maybe the rest of set theory, but for, for our purposes, um, that's complete loss of control uh, in the following sense. If you do define the integers, then trivially we win in the, in the sense that, um, uh, well, all trajectories, trajectories are F sigmas as I have defined them and F sigmas are Borel's. So if we started with a structure that defines the integers, then well, all the trajectories are there. And so trivially again, we win the game. There's no new information. If we don't define Z, uh, but then, uh, oh, I should, that's uh, too many negatives. If we avoid Z, but then we define it with our new information, then we can say uh, the best we can have here is a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, we know now that at least all of descriptive set theory is, we're facing all of descriptive set theory all of a sudden, which also includes set theoretic independence issues. So um, we could say we win in the, in the sense that we know uh, it's time to give up. With this one, we can't, we can't fight. So given these facts, we usually assume that uh, we avoid defi defining Z, and then we try to rule out new data that does define Z, because otherwise there's not much to do. So, this is this this is a template for uh, a larger a larger set of games. Um, I'm playing it with trajectories of definable vector fields in order to try to come up with to try to make precise this notion of what what should tame control theory be. So you'll see some other examples of uh, of this kind of thinking though. So some natural questions uh, come up here right off the bat with this. So what, what does the non-definability of Z imply about the vector fields of R? I mean, we're gonna start with definable vector fields. Um, if we don't define the integers, then that's some restrictions on the kinds of vector fields we can have. So uh, what, else, what else do we, does that tell us? Um, and we are playing now, their model theory is operating in the background. We're not working in a vacuum. So what else should we assume about our base structure? And uh, just as importantly, why? Um, I, uh, one could say, well, I'm going to assume things about the base structure because that makes it easy to write papers and get them published. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a reason, but um, I'm, I, I want to look a little deeper than things like that. Why are we going to make assumptions about things? 
Similarly, what else should we assume about the trajectories we consider? Remember my definition of trajectory is pretty bare bones. Uh, it's just the image of a differential of a solution. That's not going to get us very far as any of the ODE theorists in the, in the audience probably know. And another thing is they say, what else should we assume about the vector fields we consider? We're going to look at definable ones, but even that, you know, uh, there's a lot of those that we might not be interested in. And why? So why are we going to do all these things? And this is going to be basically the, at least the first part, of, a large part of my module of the graduate course is dealing with these questions. It's not going to be a course in technical ODE theory. There are much better people equipped to do that than, than I. So these are the, but this is the frame of mind that we wanna be in when we're gonna approach these things. I add, okay, I'll stop here for a second and say, are there any questions that anybody wants to ask? And of course, if we were all sitting in a room, I would have already gotten a response, but uh, since we're doing Zoom, I have no idea. So I will move on. Can you ask a question, actually? Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, when you say the vector field of this uh, structure R, do, do you mean um, vector field such that the, 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 the pre-image is de definable in this R? No. Uh, what do you mean by pre-image? Uh, the the the, the pre-image of any um, I'm I'm not I'm not um, no it's nothing uh, to say that a vector it's a set a vector field is a set it's a map from a from a set into R n hence it is a subset of R n times R n which we identify with R to the two n functions are oh, simply see. sets right. so sure. the domain is there and the image is there thank you. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay, I will move on then. I'm going to get a, now. I'm going to start getting a little more specific. That's why I wanted to take a, uh, a pause here. Here's our sort of more uh, flaky stuff, and we'll get not flaky. Interesting. Now we'll get now we'll get more detailed. So I, I, I have to fix some notation, uh, which I like to avoid, but I can't now. So uh, little omega is just gonna range over non-zero real numbers. And here are going to be some vector fields that we run across uh, very early on. If you take a course in, in ODE theory, um, it's uh, these guys here as planar vector fields. Um, but of course, in order to understand these things, we really need to understand that it's this complex scalar map um, once you identify this with a function from the complex numbers of the complex numbers this pretty much explains everything and then uh, so this uh, m sub omega i'm going to use for this thing which in words is the multiplicative group generated by e to the two pi over omega so there we go. We uh, there's a lot. Uh, I, I again trying to keep things simple. This is all I'm going to introduce for now. We'll do a lot more in the course. So try to keep these in your mind for a little bit. And uh, here's um, now we're actually going to get to something. So the starting point for for my particular investigation into the tameness is that exactly one of the following holds. Some of these are trivial. So none of these m omega are there. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there is one there, but no non-trivial trajectories of any of the um, f of the rational images of the, these f sub q omega. Okay, so remember these are these uh, classical linear vector fields. A third possibility. Uh, for Chris, some when you say definable, what, what, where is it definable? In R. In frac R. 
it's the background, it's the, it's the structure I declared at the beginning of the talk as script R is going to be an expansion of the reels. Okay, thanks. Okay. So um, the third one is that for some omega, um, all of the trajectories of these things are definable for the non-zero rationals, but no unbounded trajectories of any F sub tau with tau that's not a rational uh, multiple of omega. And then the final uh, possibility is that all trajectories are there. So you have the, wild, the wildest situation possible. Um, I, I, I think it's fair to say that essentially, this is a corollary of result of Philip uh, Hieronymi. I'm, I'm assuming he'll probably talk a little bit about this at some point. I would like to point out that uh, the result that, that I refer to here was proved at Fields in, I think it was, uh, well, it was maybe February of 2009, but while he was here as a postdoc. So this is another one of these examples uh, where the subject got a huge boost uh, from uh, work that people did at Fields. So, but this is our starting point. Now this is true for any expansion of the field of reals whatsoever, anything. I haven't, so if we're going to start talking about playing this game with trajectories, we have to figure out we're going to start, we have to start with one of these because it is a, uh, these are disjoint. We already pointed out, we don't want to start with this one because that's, uh, then the game is trivially over. So we have these other possibilities where we might start. And having added some trajectories, we're going to wind up again in one of these four cases. We hope to avoid this one because that's defining the integers again. So we go from one of these, we hope to go from one of these situations to another one and know which one it is, hopefully not this one. Or at least if it's going to be this one, we want to know it so that we know it's time to give up on that instance of the game and try something else. I'm not, I, you know, okay, yes, it's, it, when I say it's essentially, it's a corollary of, of Phillips. Uh, yeah, okay, yes, there's also some undergrad ODE theory in here that has to be done, but, but don't, let's not worry about that. That's for the course. All right, so there we go. One of these things hold. Now, what about some examples of where these hold? Well, certainly uh, the field, the real field itself doesn't define any of these cyclic uh, groups because they are all, well, they have infinitely many connected components. If I take the expansion of R by one of these groups and nothing else, then we, uh, it's a corollary basically of a result of Van Andries that you can't define any non-trivial trajectories of any of these linear vector fields. Basically, for those, uh, if you're familiar with the terminology, everything has to be a nice countable union of semi-algebraic sets, so you can't have graphs of transcendental objects in there. If I start with the field and add all trajectories, I fix an omega and then add all of the trajectories of all of these guys, uh, this will uh, define no unbounded trajectories of any other F sub tau that's not one of these. So there's our three, there's examples of our three possibilities. Oh yes, here's, so here's a little exercise for you if you're, uh, if you're, if you want something to do. Um, if you have a non-trivial trajectory of one of these uh, F omega, then you can recover all trajectories of these guys from the group and the trajectory over the field. This, this we'll talk about this in the course. Oh, there's some little things up here I don't understand. All right, let's assume I'm gonna ignore it. So there are some examples, uh, but we have some more. And, and these are some things that we'll talk about in the course um, now. So here we go. 
my 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 uh, generic structure here uh, shouldn't say generic. My fixed but arbitrary structure is O minimal if every definable set has only finitely many connected components. I'm taking advantage of working over the reals here. Model theorists are going to be thinking that this is not the right definition, but over the reals, it's actually equivalent and it's a lot easier to state. So um, evidently, if R is O minimal, uh, then none of these uh, cyclic groups can be definable because they have infinitely many connected components. So now we have a much greater store of base structures that we could work from. But I will tell you up front, there's a lot of goofy ones of these. Uh, this alone certainly does not imply O minimality by a long shot. But so there's, we have now have a, a, a nice big class of uh, examples of where we don't have the groups and we could try starting there. This is uh, not at all obvious, um, but if you start with an O minimal, if R is O minimal, and we don't define any, well, we'll just call them irrational powers. What I mean by this, this is a, the standard calculus um, abbreviation for the real power function X maps to X to the R. Uh, as long as we, uh, if, if we don't define any irrational power functions, then we can add one of these groups, any one of these groups, and we'll define no unbounded trajectories of any of the F sub tau's that's not where we're not a rational multiple of omega. So this is was the second possibility, or the yes, this was this one of the possibilities of our main classification. Actually, we know a lot more, uh, but now is not the time for details here. So, but this is something that I hope to do in, in, during the course, although it does actually involve some model theory. So I'll have to see how I can handle that. And then here's an also another fact, uh, if R is O minimal, then so is the expansion by all compact trajectories of linear planar vector fields. So you can certainly add all compact trajectories of uh, all of these guys. Now, this is a very special case of Fafian closure, uh, which is a big, you know, a big result due to Spicegger. So, okay, so here we have some nice facts about things, about O-minimal structures. Um, and it would be nice uh, if we were to keep continuing in this direction, but uh, we, we really hit a wall with this. If R is O minimal and defines no irrational powers, is the same thing true when we expand by all compact trajectories of linear vector fields, planar vector fields? It's going to be O minimal by Fafian closure. The problem is that we have no, we, we really have no idea whether this non-definability of irrational of irrational powers is preserved. In fact, we don't even know if non we don't even know if non-definability of exponentiation is preserved. It's just open. Um, the proof of Fafi enclosure does not provide this kind of uh, metric information uh, or functional. It doesn't. It does not provide the information you needed to answer this. Uh, that's Patrick's. Uh, assessment, not mine, by the way. So this is something that we bump our heads on a lot. Um, and, there, and so because of this, we're going to have to wish it away. So here we go. Uh, my main contention is that if we're going to play this game, we need to at least assume that R is O minimal, it doesn't define any irrational power functions, and it defines all compact trajectories of linear planar vector fields. We can certainly require some more. We will at various points, but we, 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 we really need to give ourselves at least these handicaps in order to get started. A prototypical example here would be the uh, famous uh, R sub n, 
which is the collection of all globally subanalytic sets. Um, the, this, uh, this structure also has all compact trajectories of all real analytic vector fields. So that's a not much nicer place to start with than just this. And here we can, in a, in, a, in a setting like this, it's nice and rich and we can get some good results. Still have enough, too many open questions, but well, we, we all have to keep our jobs. Now note the use of my use of the word contention. This is something that can't be backed up. I mean, this is, this is I'm asserting that, uh, that, that I don't think that this is, we, we should at least do this if we're gonna play this at all. Um, now I can actually provide a lot of evidence for this. I can say, why should we be O-minimal instead of just not defining any cyclic groups? I have a good argument for that. I also have a good argument for this. This just seems downright reasonable, uh, but uh, I, I think these things ought to be backed up as best as they can rather than simply um, asserted because people think this is how things should be. So part of the course will be filling, will be providing evidence for these for this contention. Well, okay, so where's the control theory? I'll, I'll, I'll take a quote here from uh, Eduardo Sontag's book. Uh, it's the area of application-oriented math that deals with the basic principles underlying the analysis and design of control systems. Now, I actually tried to look up the definition of control system. That's a little bit on the flaky side, but that's all right. We can, we can get the basic idea here. Um, application-oriented math. It does not say applied math, it just says application oriented, which is good for us because we want to do some theory here. So the first thing I want to do is say, we shouldn't just look at arbitrary trajectories. I mean, if we think we want to do this kind of control theory stuff, I haven't even decided exactly what I want to mean by this. We should at least consider trajectories that are locally a trajectory. So in other words, if you're at any point on the trajectory, you can, if you look close enough, it looks like another trajectory. It's the image of another solution. Yes, some ODE people are saying, well, you just mean an integral manifold. Well, not quite. Um, I don't mean that yet. But uh, at the moment, we could say, uh, we'll just call this thing regular for lack of anything better. We can also uh, do something, consider finite unions of such things. And as somebody, why would we? Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm experimenting now, by the way. So I'm going to try this annotate thingy and see if it works. So we could be doing something like coming along like this and then maybe deciding to change our mind and starting to loop back and coming back to some place on the trajectory. But we never actually get there in finite time. Well, this then is going to be a sort of problematic point because no matter how I draw a neighborhood around it, I'm not going to be the image of a solution. But I'm certainly just, the, I'm, I am a finite union of images of solutions. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with this picture, even though it's usually ruled out in vector field theory. But we can decompose it into uh, uh, manageable pieces. So there's my big technology thrill for the day. Oh, I have to stop this now, don't I? How do I? Uh... Huh. I seem to be stuck. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I don't do this very often. So some anti-examples, it's easier to come up with the things we don't want. Uh, this is a sort of famous thing. It's a so-called abstract center. Um, this thing is a trajectory. Regard this as a, as a vector, a linear vector field in four variables. Uh, here's a, something that any calculus student can understand the statement of. The, the trajectory itself is dense and co-dense in S1 cross S1. So certainly no matter where you look, you've got problems. 
Some other examples are given by the non-periodic trajectories of uh, Rissler or Lorenz attractors. And I was going to steal some pictures off the internet, but um, that turned out to be too much for me to figure out how to do, and then I'd have to credit them. You can look these things up anywhere. These are, th these are more uh, from, say, chaos theory than from control theory. Kind of the utter lack of control, if you will. So we don't want to look at stuff like that. So we're going to rule things like that out. So, um, Dimitri, how am I doing on time? To have about 10 minutes. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, thank you. It's just I can't see a clock at the moment and I didn't want to go turn on a phone to see it. All right. <clears throat> so now I'm going to, you know, we're going to get into some, here's some, some little details. Uh, this will transition into, I think, something that uh, uh, Philip Hieronymi will talk about later today. Uh, we have an abstract notion of a dimension here. This works for any metric space whatsoever, although you won't always see it this way. Given a metric space and a set in it and r greater than zero, we're going to let uh, n sub r e uh, be the cardinality, if you will, the number of balls of radius r needed to cover e. We allow plus infinity for convenience. Now, I know this is a bit to a uh, bit of a formula to get through, but uh, it's most efficient in logic. We define the Ocelot dimension of the set to be this thing. So it's the nth of all the s and r's for which this condition is satisfied. Now it really needs at least 10 minutes, I think, and being at a blackboard or something to unravel this uh, gobbledygook here. But um, the motto for this, uh, is this is something that comes up in analysis on metric spaces. The motto is that uh, Aswad dimension measures the size of E uh, in all scales and at all points, I guess you could also throw in there. Now, I, I got that from uh, somebody who, who, who knows about this stuff. It takes a while to understand uh, what, first of all, why should it be called a metric dimension? Uh, that's uh, routine, that's straightforward stuff that needs to be verified. Getting a handle on what exactly this means, it's, you really need to draw pictures and think about it for a while. We'll do that in the course. But just to give you an idea of where this is coming from or what the point is here, here's an example. The Asawad dimension of the integers as a subset of the reals is one. So you have a closed discrete set in your metric space that has full dimension. Youch. Now, actually, I think this is a good thing because model theorists know that not all countable sets are the same. Uh, if you, you know, that's great if you want to do Lebesgue measure theory, but in fact, they just simply aren't. So as an empirical observation, and this is just meaning if you read the literature, uh, start looking into this and studying things, sort of all of the dimensions that you run across in geometric measure theory, fractal geometry, and analysis on metric spaces, they're all going to be bounded below by ordinary topological dimension, um, which I guess in this case we could call the big covering dimension or the small inductive or the large inductive, they're all the same over the reals, um, and bounded below by topological dimension and above by Asawa dimension. Um, don't know of any other examples where this is not dominating everything. So why am I bringing this up? <clears throat> well, here's a special case of uh, Hieronymi and myself. So if E happens to be a finite union of regular trajectories of any vector fields, I'm not even bothering to talk about definable. And, uh, and the set E does not define the integers, then it has to have also a dimension one. 
for trajectories, roughly speaking, this says that you, you cannot wobble around very much. And the amount of the wobbling is uniform in a, when you move around at points on the trajectory and how small you look. So this, this condition applied to a trajectory says that it, that it really, it has to be as non-fractal as you can possibly imagine. In fact, uh, let's see, uh, people in some of, the, some of the researchers in the game say that when topological dimension matches up with Asawad dimension, they actually use the word anti-fractal because no matter what definition of fractal you might come up with, uh, uh, it won't apply. <laughs> but, this only uses that my set E doesn't define the integers, has topological dimension one, nice trajectory, and it's a Boolean combination of closed sets, finite union of nice trajectories. So this, this result of Philip and I is a, is, a, is a very big hammer in this setting. And one of the things I hope to investigate or to instigate other people to investigate is what does it say about uh, trajectories uh, if, they, if they have to have this Asawa dimension one? Um, logarithmic spirals certainly have Asawa dimension one, but so-called slow spirals do not. So, and especially if we're working in this setting, uh, in this setting where we're looking at trajectories um, over O minimal structures that don't define any irrational power functions and uh, define at least all compact trajectories of linear vector fields. So uh, this is another, yet another sort of vague, uh, but wide open question. And hopefully, hopefully an area where, where people can uh, uh, make some progress and, and yes, write some papers. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for being patient with my uh, difficulties in technology. I will now stop my share and try to rejoin the world.